when you think about corporate secrecy, nefarious shell companies, and even conspiratorial tax dodging, what comes to mind? You always think about a location like the British Virgin Islands or Bermuda or Panama or Cyprus. These are very exotic, sometimes like James Bond movie. You know, it's, it's always happening over there, right? It's, it's never over here. It's always over there. And what was interesting to me about Delaware is it's very much here. It's not over there, it is right here. And it sort of flies under the radar. Unless you live there, you probably never think about the tiny state of Delaware. But University of Chicago adjunct professor Hal Weitzman says that's a huge mistake. Most of us interact with Delaware companies at least once a day. If you think about Delaware companies like Google, Amazon, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, Visa, MasterCard, or Walgreens, or Walmart, or CVS, I could go on and on and on. Delaware is the corporate air that we breathe. Now, wait a minute, you might be saying. Isn't Amazon in Seattle? Isn't Google in California? And isn't Walmart in Arkansas? Well, it turns out that all of these companies are actually registered in Delaware. So this is a state that has fewer than a million residents. The population is about the size of the Tucson or Grand Rapids metro area, but it has 1.6 million companies registered there, including two thirds of the US's biggest public companies. And the Fortune 500. Right, but also most public companies of any size are registered in Delaware. An average of 683 businesses register in Delaware, not a week or a month, but every day. Most of them are out of state companies. They have little more than an official registration in Delaware. They don't do any real business there. They're not located there. And the companies in Delaware are not just the ones that are located in other states. They're located all around the world. The question is, why? In his new book, What's the Matter with Delaware, Weitzman goes down the complex and frankly infuriating rabbit hole to discover everything from criminal conspiracies to wealthy tax avoidance to political dark money. Well, Delaware is everywhere. Delaware plays a critical role in the capitalist system. And it's one that's really largely unexplored, at least outside of scholarly journals. From the University of Chicago Podcast Network, this is Big Brains, a podcast about the pioneering research and the pivotal breakthroughs that are reshaping our world. On this episode, what's the matter with Delaware and how to fix it? I'm your host, Paul Rand. For people on the inside, Delaware is known as the corporate capital of the world. But the rest of us don't pay much attention to the somewhat small state. Although I really like Delaware and I visited there, very unglamorous place. Nobody would say Delaware is like on my bucket list. You might remember the scene in Wayne's World, you know, where, they, where Wayne and Garth find themselves in front of a green screen that's got Delaware and they have no idea what anything. They have no association <laughs> with Delaware whatsoever. Imagine being able to be magically whisked away to... Delaware. Hi, I'm in Delaware. I want to congratulate you. That is the first Big Brains Wayne's World reference we have ever had. <laughs> hopefully, hopefully not the last. But <laughs> you know, there's sort of like an everywhere USA type feel to Delaware. It's kind of nondescript and 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 could be anywhere. You know, I said Delaware is everywhere. Delaware is also anywhere. I mean, yeah. it really could be anywhere. And so it's a it's a great front for um, conducting this very lucrative business. The first secret behind Delaware's ability to attract businesses is how easy it makes the process to register. You and I, Paul, could go and form a Delaware company by the end of this podcast. For just $1,000, you can start a business in under an hour. For an extra $500, you can cut the wait time down to 30 minutes. We don't need to go to Delaware. We can do it all online. We don't need to say that we are the owners of the company. We can make it an anonymous limited liability company. And we don't need to show any kind of identification at all in order to set up this company. The Secretary of State's office stays open till midnight so it can register companies. I mean, which other state agency do you know that is that dedicated <laughs> okay. to making business easy? So the vast majority, about 70% of the companies that are set up in Delaware every year are at limited liability companies, LLCs. And so that's where the don't ask, don't tell policy comes into effect because these, those LLCs are not required to report anything to anyone else. And that begs the obvious question. What kind of company needs to be created with complete anonymity in under 30 minutes at 11 o'clock at night? Well, possibly companies that are going to use this lack of transparency for maybe, let's say, nefarious reasons. 
It's definitely a legitimate concern, and there's a slew of examples, Paul, many of which I discuss in the book, but maybe I'll give you a few quick ones uh, that flow through Delaware. So one is the 1MDB scandal, where Malaysian officials used eight companies in Delaware to steal billions of dollars of public funds. Well, the One Malaysia Development Berhad Fund, or 1MDB, was set up in 2009 when Najib Razak was prime minister. Malaysian and US authorities allege $4.5 billion were illegally transferred from it into offshore bank accounts and shell companies. Some of which ended up being used to make the uh, movie The Wolf of Wall Street, if you remember that one. Delaware businesses were used by international arms trafficker Victor Bout to disguise profits involving the trafficking of arms. His crimes are the stuff of Hollywood. After agreeing to sell millions of dollars worth of weapons to a rebel group on the U.S. terrorist list, Victor Boot was found guilty on four conspiracy charges by an American jury. Another example is LAN, the former Chilean airline. It's now changed its name, but about 10 years ago, it paid bribes to Argentine labor union bosses using a Delaware LLC. So there we have kleptocracy, we have corruption. And there's also plenty of domestic examples of people using Delaware LLCs for less than above board reasons. Tonight, President Trump's former campaign chairman, Paul Manafort, is a convicted felon who could spend the rest of his life behind bars. After four days of deliberations, the jury rendering its verdict guilty on five counts of tax evasion, one count of failing to report a foreign bank account, and two counts of bank fraud. Paul Manafort conducted his tax evasion scheme using 16 companies, nine of which were in Delaware. Porn star Stormy Daniels files a new lawsuit, this time claiming her former attorney and President Trump's personal lawyer, Michael Cohen, colluded to manipulate her to benefit Cohen and President Trump. The money Trump's lawyer Michael Cohn used to pay Stormy Daniels came through, well, you guessed it, a Delaware LLC. And then a really horrific case is Backpage. Backpage.com is one of America's largest classified websites, but it's best known for selling sex. The majority of Backpage's revenue is generated through prostitution-related ads in its adult services section. Law enforcement officials have dubbed it the world's top online brothel. In fact, at its height, Backpage was involved in three quarters of the child trafficking reports received by the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. This was a Delaware registered company that even months after it was shut down by federal law enforcement in 2018, was still considered to be in good standing by the Delaware Secretary of State's office because they paid their annual fees. So there's a case of human trafficking, there are cases of money laundering, of arms trafficking, of drugs trafficking, all not going through Delaware, but all using Delaware businesses. And as I say, with the protection of the United States law. It's a way to dress up bad behavior, right? It sort of, it puts a business suit and tie on activities like money laundering and, and, and drug trafficking by saying, well, we have a Delaware LLC. How more legitimate could you be? Coca-Cola and, and, and Google have one as well. Now, I should point out, there's a huge difference between the kind of Apples and Googles, which are public companies, and we they are required to report a huge amount of information. But there is a huge section of the US economy and the global economy that is made up of private companies, largely in Delaware, limited liability companies. Keep in mind, these examples are just the ones that got caught. It could be possible that even some terrorist organizations are using this system, meaning a U.S. state could be undermining the national security of the federal government. But let me give you a much more recent example, which is when Russia um, invaded Ukraine, we said as a country that we want to uh, strangle the Russian oligarchs' flow of money around the world. That was an effort that the U.K. and the European Union and the U.S. kind of spearheaded. The United States Department of Justice is assembling a dedicated task force to go after the crimes of the Russian oligarchs. We're joining with European allies to find and seize their yachts, their luxury apartments, their private jets. We're coming for you, ill-begotten gains. The fact is, in the U.S., one of the things that's hampering that fight is we have no idea who is behind the companies that are formed in this country because of this corporate anonymity. So it undermines our own foreign policy and national security because we don't know where the oligarchs are operating. And it isn't just idle speculation because there have been oligarchs who have been traced to Delaware LLCs. In one case, somebody who was using a Delaware LLC to buy property in Washington. And the only way that came to light 
It's not because federal officials charged anyone. It was because the Washington Post sent reporters around the neighborhood and the neighbors of this person identified that he was the owner of the house. So we have no idea. And in fact, when I, when I was doing the research for this book, I just wanted to double check. And I called the Secretary of State's office in Delaware and said, just tell me a basic fact. How many of the companies registered in Delaware are U.S. companies and how many are owned by people outside the U.S.? And they said, we don't know and there is no way of knowing. And that, to me, is a very scary situation, but also means that when we say we want to cut off funds to terrorist organizations or to Russian oligarchs, we are unable to do so because we just don't have the information we would need. And finally, this anonymity structure even facilitates the influx of so-called dark money into politics. Right. So we, of course, have Citizens um, United, which was a judgment that allows companies to give unlimited donations to political campaigns. And some people threw their hands up and said, it's the end of everything. But there actually are some transparency rules in place. For example, a super PAC has to report its donors. One of the challenges, if you dig into that information, is often the donors are anonymous Delaware LLCs, which means that you and I don't really know who's funding the campaigns uh, that we are being asked to cast our vote for. This idea about a lack of transparency. We're here in Illinois. Is there a, a different level of transparency necessary, for example, than there would be in Delaware? There are states that ask for ownership information. But one of the challenges is, uh, imagine if you're in a state that asks for ownership information, like Massachusetts being one. I could make the ownership of my Massachusetts LLC a Delaware LLC, which is anonymous. So in this way, it sets the standard by making, by allowing anonymous corporations, it sets the standard for pretty much anywhere. This is what Weitzman means when he says that Delaware is virtually inescapable. Because of its corporate monopoly, the rules it sets become the competition for business every other state must meet. This even has had an effect on what interest rate credit card companies can charge you because, well, this shouldn't be surprising, four out of the five largest credit card companies are registered in Delaware. Yes, and, and, and lots of other financial institutions as well. And that, that flows from a history that dates back to 1981 when there was a, a battle to attract the big New York banks and Delaware invited Chase Manhattan and JP Morgan, two of the biggest banks, to form a secret task force to write the laws that would govern Delaware and therefore the whole of the United States. Uh, because if you think about it, if, I, if I'm allowed to charge unlimited interest, then that pertains everywhere. There's nothing another state can do about that because once a credit card company registers in Delaware, the rules of Delaware apply, not the rules of the other states. So this neuters any attempt elsewhere to put interest rates caps, caps in place. And the, the rules that they wrote in 1981 enabled lenders to charge unlimited interest rates, to raise interest rates retroactively, to levy unlimited fees, and to foreclose on homes belonging to people who defaulted on their credit card. And if this weren't enough, Delaware also maintains its incorporation monopoly by helping businesses avoid paying taxes. You know, I tell a story in the book about Ramon Fonseca, who was one half of Mossack Fonseca, the law firm, you might remember, that was based in Panama, whose papers were leaked, and that was the Panama. Yes, the Panama Papers. Right. The papers were a leak of over 11 million confidential documents from the files of the Panamanian law firm Mossack Fonseca. It's one of the world's biggest suppliers of secretive offshore companies. The papers revealed how the powerful and wealthy around the world hid money, dodged sanctions and evaded tax. And so the story I tell is that an American investigative journalist went down there in the 1980s um, and interviewed Ramon Fonseca and he talked to him about all the different locales around the world. And at the end of the interview, he said, so you help people hide money all around the world. Where do you keep your money? And Ramon Fonseca said, quick as a flash, in Delaware. They'll never find it there. Delaware has multiple ways it helps corporations avoid taxes. It even has its own loophole named after the state. Well, the Delaware loophole is an elegant tax dodge that makes Delaware a domestic tax haven for big companies. One of the best examples of a company using the Delaware loophole revolved around Home Depot. In the case of Home Depot, this is a company based in Atlanta, but registered in Delaware. In the 1990s, Home Depot set up a company they called Homer Depot, a not very clever pun named after its lovable mascot. And this company, Homer, helped 
Home Depot dodge billions of dollars in taxes. So this is how it worked. They set up this Delaware subsidiary. They assigned to it all its trademarks. These are things like slogans like the Home Depot, which is actually a trademark slogan, or where low prices are just the beginning. And all the 1,200 Home Depot stores around the US paid a proportion of their sales revenue to Homer to use those trademarks. So previously, they had used those trademarks for free, but by creating this entity, they flowed billions of dollars through Homer. And here's the kicker, Homer in Delaware didn't have to pay any tax because Delaware doesn't tax revenue from so-called intangible investments like patents and trademarks if the company isn't physically located in Delaware. The rest of the company can write it off as a business expense. So in this case, this company, Homer, had four employees total, a lawyer, a paralegal, and two administrative assistants. But by 2000, it was earning revenues of $2 billion a year. So this is a well-known tax dodge, the Delaware loophole. In this case, the state of Arizona sued and won. But there are many other cases where there's not been legal action. It's been used by companies like Toys R Us, Walmart, Gap, Ikea, Victoria's Secret. Perhaps my favorite example, if I can just squeeze it in, is, is WorldCom. Do you remember WorldCom, the old telecoms company, right? So WorldCom paid its Delaware holding company $20 billion over three years. And the intangible asset that it was paying for was so-called management foresight. So it was saying that the profits that the company made were supposedly made because of the superior skill of its top executives. So, you know, in this case, uh, there is a very clear, it's not really a loophole. I mean, it's more like a deliberate policy to attract this kind of revenue. And of course, the revenue doesn't, doesn't flow to Delaware. They just get the fees. The revenue flows back to the companies. And so it helps the companies get richer and it helps the states that those companies located in get poorer because they collect less tax. And it's not just wealthy companies that Delaware's system helps avoid taxes. It's wealthy individuals as well. Delaware is part of a system where the wealthiest people in the world in some years pay no federal income tax at all, not a penny. When you think about an LLC, an LLC can be a single individual. There's also trusts, which are a well-known way for, for people to uh, defend their wealth, let's put it that way. And I'll give you one example, which is the art market, right? And which is so fascinating, the largest unregulated market in the world. In fact, one third of the wealthiest people in the world participate in this market. Many speculate more for investment reasons than for a love of art. You know, if you, if you buy a painting at Christie's in New York, you don't have to identify who you are. You're usually not in the actual auction room, right? It's someone on the phone. And you don't have to identify where the money comes from to buy the artwork either. So it's a completely unregulated market and a huge market, of course. So if you buy a painting at Christie's in New York, uh, New York charges you 9% sales tax. So how do you avoid, let's imagine on a $100 million painting, it's a very significant sum, $9 million. You could use that to buy some nice other, some more art. So if you want to save that money, you can take the art, put it in a truck, ship it directly to Delaware, where there is a so-called free port, which is a customs a free zone. Uh, and it's located in a former factory that used to make those foam packing peanuts, which have largely gone out of, of uh, use. And so in that factory, they have created a high security, temperature controlled art facility. You'll never see the art, nor will the owners, because it all has to be stored very carefully. But that's where the art goes. Now, it goes straight from New York there to, to, to Delaware, where there's no zero sales tax. And nobody pays any tax on that. So they've avoided paying tax in the city of New York. Then I can put that in a trust, and I can hand that trust over to my heirs, and my heirs can enjoy the art themselves and they don't have to pay any tax when I hand the asset over. So we have a, a system that works for the very wealthiest. Let's face it, most of us are not buying $100 million paintings. So it works for the very wealthiest to save them uh, from paying taxes. And that's kind of a microcosm of the entire tax system that we, the people who pursue and are most effective at getting tax breaks are not the middle class. It's the uber wealthy. I'm not done yet to go into the solution because there's another tentacle coming out of this beast that we're painting a picture of here. And, and that is this idea of bankruptcies. And so even if you've got this great advantage of all the tax savings that we're talking about, if there is a bankruptcy within something that happens in Delaware, how does that play itself out? 
Well, so Delaware is kind of for corporate life events. Companies go there to, to get born, if you continue the analogy. They go there to, to get married. Uh, M&A is all in Delaware because that's where they're registered. And then, you know, they go there when they declare bankruptcy. So bankruptcy is a very nice business for Delaware. It's a, you know, that's a billion dollar business in itself. All of this is very beneficial to Delaware lawyers who, by the way, are the most expensive per hour lawyers in the world, right? So you think Washington lawyers are expensive? You think New York, California lawyers are expensive? Delaware lawyers charge more than any of them. Well, at this point, it's pretty clear about what's the matter with Delaware. But how did this system come about and what can we do to fix it? Well, that's after the break. Have you ever wondered who you are but didn't know who to ask? Well, then join Professor Eric Oliver as he poses the nine most essential questions for knowing yourself to some of humanity's wisest and most interesting people. Nine Questions with Eric Oliver, part of the University of Chicago Podcast Network. Big Brains is supported by the University of Chicago Graham School. Are you a lifelong learner with an insatiable curiosity? Join us at Graham and access more than 50 open enrollment courses every quarter in literature, history, religion, science, and more. We open the doors of you, Chicago, to learners everywhere. Expand your mind and advance your leadership. Online and in-person offerings are available. Learn more at graham.uchicago.edu slash bigbrains. Not only is a lack of transparency a problem when it comes to the outcomes of Delaware's system, the way that system itself operates suffers from opacity. One prime example is something called the Corporation Law Council. The Corporation Law Council is a, is a group of 27 lawyers. They, they effectively write the code, and then they give the changes to the code to the legislature, which is full of part-time lawmakers, paid $40,000 a year, that has just four lawyers in it, and they do not have the capacity to scrutinize these proposed changes. And remember, because Delaware is everywhere, this one group of 27 lawyers effectively is writing the corporate code for the entire country. So what is the corporate code? It spells out the duties of executives uh, to shareholders. And so 26 of them are working lawyers, Paul. So they go to court, they then argue under the rules that they themselves have set. So when we think about the way that decision-making gets done in Delaware, it reminds me of the work of George Stiegler, the famous University of Chicago economist who came up with the idea of regulatory capture. And for Stiegler, regulatory capture meant that interest groups come to control lawmaking and regulation of their own sectors so that the regulators end up kind of being the lobbyists for the industries that they're supposed to oversee. But in Delaware, they've kind of perfected and institutionalized that. So the lawyers... The lawyers don't even need to lobby the legislature to change the corporate code. They just write it themselves. And we don't even get the rationale for them. We just get the, the amendments to the corporate code themselves. And then the legislature are called on to, to vote over something they really don't understand. So I've repeatedly said to people from Delaware, doesn't this feel a little bit like the fox guarding the hen house? And I've always been kind of shooed away. This question about being shooed away or other things that go into this, I, I imagine at this point, as people are listening, you ought to be pretty agitated. I'm getting agitated talking to you. How in the world is this not a problem? And, and based on everything that you're saying, how is this not seen as a problem? Wow, you are so asking me to get into the psychology of, of the entire legal and financial community. I think <laughs> because it's been around for a long time, then it's hard for people who are in that world to take a step back and think about the costs and the benefits of it. There are undoubtedly benefits. I mean, it's an efficient system. The legal community, let me take that, legal scholarship has looked a lot at Delaware and they will say things like, well, this is very effective because we, we bypass any, any politicization. And when I see that, I think that's not a good thing. The politicization is that's where society comes in. Companies tell us that they want to have a purpose. They want to be socially useful. Where does society appear? Well, normally it would appear in with the checks and balances with the politicians, but they're not there. So that's why one of the proposals I make is that we should add to that corporation council lawyers who specifically represent workers, who represent you know the environment and general social purpose, so that we get a better sense from them about our companies doing what they are, what they tell us they want to be doing. 
you know, at uh, at some point and probably intermittently throughout this, everybody's probably sitting there saying, wait a minute, isn't our president from Delaware? Isn't our president from Delaware? He was a, a senator there for, what, 36 years? Yes, he was. Yeah. And so what is what, if anything, has Biden said during his time in office about this is an issue? Well, I think it's important to point out that he did not create the system, but he is very much a creature of the system. And I don't just mean system of incorporation. I mean, the Delaware way, this behind closed doors type way of doing business. You know, his style exemplifies the system. He's been funded by the system and his voting record reflects the system in terms of his who who funded his campaigns. So if you take out his presidential campaign, but over those 36 years of his Senate campaigns, his biggest owners were the very law firms that write the rules and charge those highest hourly fees in the, in the US. Uh, it's the same law firms that you'll see in the main square down in, in Wilmington that are, have their offices all around and are so influential in every aspect of Delaware life. And then in terms of his voting record, at times, he's definitely acted to defend the interests of, for example, credit card companies. So Biden did not create the system, but he's very much a creature of it. If we wanted to be fair to Delaware, it's difficult to imagine them reforming this system without absolutely tanking the state in the process. That's right. So the, the, the franchise, as they call it, which is this incorporations business, this business formations uh, industry, collectively amount to about 40 percent of Delaware's state revenue. So there are huge benefits that flow into Delaware. It's They call Delaware a blue spending state with red taxes. So they have pretty low taxes relative to the rest of us. They, they pay about 50 cents for every dollar of services they receive. It does not encourage a lot of debate and scrutiny uh, because uh, it's scared of losing this business. And when somebody puts the head above the parapet and has occasionally said, why are we doing this? Or what are the implications of doing this? They're told, pipe down unless you want your taxes to go up. But Weitzman points out in his book that there are other opportunities to fix many of these problems. I didn't want to write one of those books, Paul, where they say, the solution is we need a global authority to do X. Because it always seems to me, I read those kind of books and I think, ah, that's not going to happen. I enjoyed the book, but it's very un unrealistic. So I, everything I argued, I tried to make very modest extensions to what's already happening. One of those solutions that's already underway is something called the Corporate Transparency Act. The Corporate Transparency Act was a bill that was passed in 2020 and, and was signed actually by President Trump in one of the last days of his, his administration. It was a bipartisan bill that essentially said this system of corporate anonymity has to end. So we are going to mandate that everybody who owns a company in the United States has to tell the federal government who they are, has to identify its so-called beneficial uh, owners. And so we're going to set up a registry. Um, and I do have some issues with the, with the registry. The rules are still being written, but it's, it appears there's going to be a loophole for trusts. Well, th that, that is going to be a challenge because our trusts are well known, for example, a vehicle used by Russian oligarchs. So the first thing I would suggest is that we just close that loophole. The second challenge I have with the Corporate Transparency Act is that that registry will only be visible to the Treasury and other federal government and law enforcement uh, agencies. So that concerns me. First of all, there's not a good history of interagency cooperation between federal government, state agencies, and, and we've, we've been down that road before and it's not ended well. So I worry about that. And I also worry about the ability of the government to be able to verify and investigate the information um, that's provided. Um, you know, bear in mind that the agency that's going to collect this information is a small unit in the Treasury called FinCEN, the Financial Crimes Unit. It has about 300 employees. Currently, they are snowed under with red flag warnings from banks that are, have to trace. Anyone who's done a money transfer recently knows there's much more stringent rules on anti-money laundering. So they have to trace where money comes from. So that's tens of millions of new documents that we're expecting them somehow to go through, analyze, make sense of, and find their own red flags. And in order to do that, the Biden administration has said we want a bigger staff there. So they're expanding it to 400, which doesn't fill me with a lot of confidence that they'll have the, the capacity to do that. So my suggestion is that they make that registry public because we've seen that journalists, for example, through the Panama Papers and then more recently the Pandora Papers, which was another huge leak, even bigger, actually, that journalists are pretty good at following the money 
And this could be a way to hold um, you know, the uber wealthy and politicians to account. Then I just have two quick proposals about Delaware itself. This corporation council should, first of all, explain to the legislature what are the changes and why are they necessary, the changes that it wants to make every year to the corporate code. And second, because companies tell us they're not just about making profits, but they have a social purpose, I do think it's important that we bring in other lawyers who can offer the perspective of workers of the environment and of society in general, and to give us the best possible governance standards who are independent of the lawyers who work for the companies themselves or for their shareholders. Now, these are all pretty modest goals, but they would be a good start on the road to a healthier balance between efficiency and transparency in our economic system. The thing that I'm trying to push for is just greater transparency. And I don't think that transparency is a left-wing liberal idea. I think it's actually a very pro-business, pro-free market idea. You know, transparency improves uh, capital formation, it improves price discovery, and it certainly improves regulation. I'll just leave you with one thought, which is very recently there have been proposals put forward. We talked about some of the problems with the Corporate Transparency Act. Some of the states are acting on their own because they don't think the Corporate Transparency Act goes far enough. And unfortunately, this has been prompted by Ukraine. So the, the, the impetus has not been a positive one, but the effect is very exciting. And that's that in New York and in Alaska, which is a big home of trusts, there are proposals uh, that will be voted on in New York, hopefully in the next couple of months, to force companies to identify their owners all companies, I think, including trust. So that's a very exciting development. There is a push for greater transparency. And it's not that I want Delaware to disappear off the map of the United States. I just want to open things up. In fact, I'll tell you a funny thing that uh, one of the working titles that we had for this for this book was shut down Delaware, like shut down the business. <laughs> and then I said, I said to my editor, but it's not about shutting down, it's about opening up. I just want, as they say, the sunlight to stream in so we have a better understanding of who owns the companies that benefit from the laws of the United States. Big Brains is a production of the University of Chicago Podcast Network. If you like what you heard, please leave us a rating and a review. The show is hosted by Paul M. Rand and produced by me, Matt Hodap, and Leah Cesarine. Thanks for listening. Mm-hmm.